the Devonian extinction strangled three quarters of the world's marine life to death. But on land, the forests kept thriving. Any creature looking to survive the disaster at sea would have to seek greener pastures, literally, and that would require some anatomical innovation. So you have a variety of fish that actually um, are maneuvering their way around in shallow water, and they have these lobe-like fins that actually, if you look at the fossils of them, they actually you can start to see the, the rays of fins actually have distinct bones. And it's this lineage of fish that eventually evolves into amphibians. With the sea suffocating and the lush land beckoning, the menu required updating. Pioneering fish like Tiktaalik, a descendant of the bony fish that slipped through the first mass extinction, had already been experimenting with life where the shallows meet the land. It had gills to breathe in water, but also a primitive lung for breathing air and four robust fins that would later become legs. Fleeing the choking oceans, Tiktaalik and its family, the Sarcoptera Aegeans, crept out of the water and slithered through the second great extinction. And the world would never be the same. A new chapter in the history of life began. And again, in the race of life, the winners give rise to new branches of the evolutionary tree. In the new age of the Permian, the first modern trees developed. Photosynthesis enriched the air with oxygen. At the same time, the continents drifted together to form a supercontinent, Pangaea, a vast new territory for land-going animals to explore and exploit. Animals unlike anything the world had ever seen before evolved to handle life on terra firma, where conditions like temperature varied much more wildly and harshly than in the seas. To protect their offspring, big predators like the Gorgonopsians began to lay the first eggs with hard shells. All the early land animals walked on four legs, hence the name tetrapods, a body plan that's as revolutionary as any in the story of life. And some were quite flamboyant. What you've got are animals that look like a big iguana with a great big sail on its back. It's likely that these sails were for either impressing the other sex or for moderating heat. You can rotate towards the sun, and your blood is warmed up on this big warming surface. Or you can rotate away from the sun, you can cool it down. These polycosaurs, with their iconic sails, lived alongside Dysonodonts herbivores with a new innovation, a beak designed to excavate the tough roots on which they fed. These huge animals were probably hunted by the biggest predators in Pangaea, like the Titanophonius or Titanic killer, a reptile that could grow to a length of five meters.
In the seas, 100 million years after the collapse of the oceans, vibrant new lifescapes flourished. You would have just loved scuba diving in the Permian. And you've got all these incredible creatures that are out swimming around. There's corals, there's cephalopods. The fish has gotten big now, and you've got your first sharks. Certainly one of the most amazing is this animal called Helicoprion. It basically had this whirl of teeth mounted in its lower jaw, and it would slam into its upper jaw, and it was a slicing mechanism. It swam around in the sea and just chopped stuff in half, and then came back and ate it. The massive fossilized teeth from this buzzsaw shark suggest it could have grown to a length of 12 meters. On land and in the water, the biodiversity of the Permian was simply spectacular. But it was doomed. The most devastating natural catastrophe the Earth has ever seen so far awaited them. A cataclysm that would transform this paradise into hell on Earth for millions of years. Some 250 million years ago, in what is now Siberia, the Earth tried to turn itself inside out. These vast cliffs, called traps, formed when the planet belched lava over and over again for tens of thousands of years. Iceland, one of the most volcanically active countries in the world, is entirely built by lava flows. It is an open-air laboratory for geologists like Patrick de Wever, and embedded in the rock, he finds the barrels of a lava flow's smoking guns. When there is an emission of lava, there are holes in the mass of rock, and these holes are filled with gases, which come out at the same time as the magma. There are different types of gas. There's water vapor, there are sulfur oxides, and carbon dioxide. We know water vapor is a greenhouse gas, which tends to raise the temperature, as does carbon dioxide. But sulfur oxides have a double effect. On the one hand, they cause acid rain and they also partially block out sunlight, leading to a drop in temperature and lower light levels, which means a reduction in photosynthesis and so perhaps fewer plants. And since animals feed on plants, fewer plants mean herbivores start to die, and then, in turn, the carnivorous animals die too. The Permian Jurassic extinction was the mother of all extinctions. Basically, a lot of our friends that have been with us for the entire Paleozoic, things like trilobites, the last trilobite goes. Lots of these earlier marine organisms, they've, they've survived through much of the earlier extinctions. Sorry, can't make it through. 